Thank you. I am the director of sales and marketing for Accor Acoustics. Uh, we actually have a very, very brief press event that we're going to shoot right now. So we're going to turn the music down. You do not have to leave the room by any stretch. This is just going to be a few moments of me explaining what's going on in the system. So you might even find this educational and informative, but I did want to explain what's going on. So uh, I am very excited to showcase the new VRC from Acora Acoustics. Uh, the Valerio Cora reference is the culmination of decades of hard work and the passion and values of not just one man, but an entire family. So Valerio Cora, of course, the brilliant engineer and designer of the loudspeaker, but his wife, Sherry, being an important influence, were often asked, why do these loudspeakers look the way that they do? And the answer is Sherry. Why? because Sherry and Valerio created their courtship, their relationship over music, right? How romantic. They went to concerts together, they saw movies together, they listened to music together, and of course, eventually they had a family together. And as this family came together, Sherry realized the importance of music and what it meant to spend time as a family. And so as this project progressed, as time went on, and she encouraged Valerio to continue with his design aspirations, one thing became critically important, and that was it had to be present. So when you have a one-year-old and a five-year-old and a 10-year-old and a couple of big dogs running around, what do you do to make sure that music is present? You make it stable, you make it so these things can't fall over or be knocked down. It is actually a part of the design philosophy of some of these speakers. So these are designed to be in a family room with your family, not in a stereo room in dad's room far away. They are quite resilient. Uh, novel applications of technology here include the deployment of the perfect cabinet, mathematically perfect cabinet that we've seen in the other loudspeakers. What is a mathematically perfect cabinet? This is not a question that gets asked often enough. And that means that the outside structure itself, the way that these pieces come together, create all the structural integrity, rigidity, and damping required in order to make the loudspeaker work. So if I wouldn't destroy a chainsaw in the process of trying to cut this down the middle, along with several other loudspeakers, you would find that this has damping material in it, but no cross bracing. Right? We don't have any cross bracing, so it doesn't take up all of this room. And this does several things for us. Number one, it allows us to capture the full internal volume, so a little over five cubic feet. Why does that matter? Because space is base. That's where you get your low frequency extension. So in a nominal room, this, this loudspeaker is flat to 18 cycles. That's not down three dB, that's flat. Why is that important? because that means we have useful output at 14 cycles, which is the lowest note on a traditional large organ. It's the lowest note that we know of continuously in music today. It's also important because we get lots of efficiency, we get lots of sensitivity as a byproduct of this design. It's not the goal, but it is a useful consequence of what happens. So these enormous loudspeakers are roughly 94 to 95 dB, one watt, one meter. So for those of you with 50, 60, 80 watt tube amplifiers, you have all the power you need today already to go. You don't need thousands and thousands of watts of clean power in order to make these move. Now, don't get me wrong, more power is always better. We're very, very grateful to partner with uh, Kevin Hayes and the wonderful team at VAC, along with Jacques at Oracle, because everything matters and we definitely want to get everything that's possible. The complement of drivers in this, of course, two 12-inch drivers uh, for the base. We have two 5-inch mid-ranges, and we have a, approximately a 34-millimeter beryllium tweeter. All the other drivers are made out of paper, and people ask me all the time, why paper? It's a really good question. What are the two things that we know of that are the most ancient created by man still intact today? One, the pyramids of Giza, right? And the other, papyrus. Scrolls and paper from tens of thousands of years ago, the Dead Sea Scrolls from 6,000 years ago, paper and stone coming together as some of the greatest materials that mankind has ever worked with, created by nature, because we haven't figured out how to do better yet. So while there is going to be a lot of interest in this loudspeaker in terms of some of the reviews that have come out and the pressure and the low frequency and the loudness, one of my favorite stories to recount is how much resolution exists in this system. 
Uh, Valerio's wife, Sherry, who I've mentioned before, listened to one of my favorite pieces of music together, um, and that is Alice in Chains at the MTV Unplugged. It was such an incredible recording. Now, for those who don't know, I mean, I grew up in this era, so Lane Staley, and the story of Alice in Chains was very, very important to me. And this recording took place shortly after Lane Staley uh, came out of rehab, uh, recovering from his heroin addiction. Now, nobody really knew if he was going to show up to this concert or not, but the producers had booked it. It was a big deal, and I was excited to share this with Sherry in the moment. So we were just sitting kind of in the middle of the room there. And I asked her, I said, can you tell me where is everybody? She goes, oh, no, 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 I, I am not going to do this. No, I can't do this. Sherry, it's just, it's just us. Like, tell me, tell me what you hear, what's, what's going on. Like, where's the singer? Where is Lane? And she goes... I don't know, this feels like kind of a trick question. I'm like, oh, that's an interesting response. What do, what do you mean by that? She goes, well, it's like, it sounds like there's musicians in front of him. It sounds like there's a guitarist and a bassist in front of him. And it almost sounds like he is the singer is kind of in the back. And I said, that's it's really fascinating. I said, I said, that's true. And she goes, really? I said, absolutely. I said, here's another question. I said, is he sitting or is he standing? And she goes, come on, Isaac. This is, this is like a trick you're messing with me. I said, I, I hear you. I said, but what do you think? And she just, she listens. She goes, I think he's, I think he's sitting, but he's, he's, he's too high. I said, is it possible he's sitting on a bar stool? And she goes, oh my goodness, that's exactly what it is. And I show her the picture of the recording where Lane Staley is sitting in the middle of the band, hunched over, singing. That is something remarkably special. To have somebody who cares not for the artifice of audiophilia, to sit down, to experience space, to have that moment of clarity, to be in the room with people who are no longer with us because Lane sadly died after this recording. He relapsed and, and died after he took his next shot of heroin, which was one of the greatest losses of music in that era. And so in this moment, we have the opportunity to recapture a time and space that existed once and will never be back again except when we are together in this room. And that is really what the VRCs are about. It's not about numbers, it's not about power, it's not about any of that other stuff. It is about space, it's about the time machine, it's about recapturing those moments that connected us to the people that we loved. So in 40 years we can sit next to each other holding hands and say, do you remember what it was like to be there? And that's what reference is all about. I'd also like to take a moment to introduce Jacques. Jacques Ramzou is a friend of uh, almost uh, four decades, it feels like. Uh, yeah. I've had the privilege of listening to his turntables in my home since I was four years old. So over the course of 34 years plus, uh, we have had the opportunity to see many, many improvements in his design, and I would really like to give uh, one of my greatest mentors and a person I admire very much a chance to chat a little bit about some of the stuff that he's worked on. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it was great hearing what you have to say about the speakers, and I totally share this. And what I love about what we've been doing here, uh, I'm also extremely grateful to be uh, paired with, team with, with uh, such uh, talent, uh, Kevin and Valerio and the teams, obviously. And we've been putting here together a, a, a quite a special event where we're able to bring people that are past or still alive in this room and e express their talent and we're able to witness this uh, with great emotion and on on our side uh, <laughs> com com you know if I compare this to the weight of the speakers, the turntable was not designed for kids. So, so there are some very delicate elements in there that uh, uh, when your kid is getting close to the turntable, it gives you the, it makes you tremble a little bit. Uh, but on our side, what, what we've been doing, we've been at this for the last four decades. We introduced, the turntable was designed in 1979. And since that time, we kept the basic geometry alive, but everything within kept improving. So uh, we're now, we're introducing at the show the, the Delphi MK7. Uh, so this is our latest generation, which is not a radical change from the early designs. I could take the parts that we built back in, in 1982 and fit them on this turntable and the same thing goes around. So it opens the door to 
uh, upgradability so people can bring in, which they do, their old oracles and we're able to spec them up to what we build today. With the MK7, well, it's accumulation of all the work that we've done and uh, without going too deep into the technicalities, uh, the, the, the result with a turntable, it's a mechanical device. And a mechanical device, if you're, if you, you're able to make yourself small enough to fit in the groove of a record, you see that anything that happens on the outside, bearing, uh, chattering, uh, loop, resonance in the arm tube, many, many, many things, uh, will have a huge impact on what the cartridge is able to do. And so our talent or, and, and our efforts over the years was to be able to uh, focus on all the strategic elements that make it possible to, to have a, a, such a precision instrument. So very rapidly, without going into details, we have silicone damping uh, devices that act like a focus in a camera. So it allows the user to really dial in the image of the turntable by controlling how the energy is transferred and how the top platform, like the playing platform, is maintained uh, stable. And then even our bearing design uh, has been, uh, is very special because it's kind of a dual tripod design, not kind of, it is a dual tripod design uh, using peak screws, uh, precision screws. And so it allows us to reach very high standards of accuracy. And to protect that bearing, so we decided to go to a two-piece bladder from the original one that was a one-piece bladder. And the reason for this is simple. Uh, the, those, this dual tripod is somewhat fragile. So if, when inserting the platter, if you kind of go uh, wiggle the thing a little bit, well, you can impact the uh, precision that we we built in the design. So having a two-piece splatter so the center hub is very light and once you fill it with oil and drop it in place it will stay and you don't ever have to remove it again so it protects the accuracy which is vital to the level of performance that this unit will be able to retrieve. After that we kept pushing further and further. We, we use uh, a synchronous motor and we split the motor apart and, and balance the coils so we have a very even force being generated inside the motor. Furthermore, we pushed on our AC synchronous uh, drive unit and again we're able to precisely calibrate the, up, the, the, the positive sine wave and negative sine wave so we get it perfectly balanced. The purpose of all this is to prevent any cogging effect in the motor. So. Uh, and, it, and then if we go to, to the last part of the features of the MK7, um, it's the, our turbo power supply. So even inside the turbo power supply, we have uh, a, a precision calibration that allows us to, like for instance, this one we dialed it at 24.35 volts DC, and we're able to hear differences in the calibration if I put it at 24.35 or 24.1 or 24.5, you hear it very clearly. Uh, Kevin uh, from back was, was part of the team uh, helping me do the final calibration of the turntable and, and the cartridge uh, package here. And uh, we, it was, we were all blown away by, by the, you know, how small changes have such an impact on, on, the, on the sonic performance of the turntable. So the Delphi as it is today is, is in my view, one of the most advanced techni technology, whatever, technology. Um, so it, it's technically advanced in the sense that it has all those levels of adjustability. And by doing that, you're able to dial in the performance to a level that once it's done, you don't have to play with that all the time. Once it's done, it's done. But it has, it offers the possibility of bringing this mechanical device, which is just spinning a motor, a platter, and keep this in such a synergy that it is allowing the music to, to, to live through 
uh, this thing be doing and spinning so accurately. So that is in a few words. <laughs> yes. No, I really appreciate that. But all of this comes together. We have source. We have loudspeakers, so we have something at the beginning of the chain and something at the end of the chain. But I'd really like to introduce somebody important, and that is Kevin Hayes from BAC, because it is his statement phono stage, his statement line stage, and we also have the statement amplifiers available to power the system to give as much of what we can get off of that record into these speakers as possible. And I'd love to turn it over to my friend Kevin for a few moments to chat a little bit about what makes BAC special. Thank you, Arson. And I have to reiterate what a privilege it is to be a part of this exhibit, this presentation with Val, Sherry, Isaac, Jacques. This is a coming together of people with a common shared passion to bring music back to life. I call it preserving the breath of life in the music. And that's been a passion of mine since I was in my teenage years. And I come now with about 35 years of experience in developing and, and manufacturing amplifiers and I think one point that Isaac, I think, mentioned to me in discussion yesterday, which is worth discussing in terms of the philosophy of VAC, is that we're not trying to build a tube amplifier. We're not trying to build a tube sound. We're trying to present music with as much of the color and the passion and the emotion and the veracity that we possibly can. My experience has led me to believe that vacuum tubes are intrinsically the best way to get as far as we can toward that goal of create a convincing illusion of the real musical event in your home, or in this case, in this ballroom. That happens for a number of reasons. I don't want to go deeply into technical conversation. Any one of you can contact me and we can have long technical discussions. But features and what's in the box aren't the important thing. What happens when you use the, the device, what it does for you is the important thing. The point about a vacuum tube is it is fundamentally more than 100 years after its invention, the most linear amplifying device ever created. That is, changes in equaling changes out happen to the greatest degree with a vacuum tube, more than you can even come close to with a transistor or the solid state devices. That allows me as a designer to build a simpler circuit with fewer parts in it to mess up the sound and still produce the linearity, the low distortion, and all the measured kind of attributes that you would want to. Uh, present the music. Um, measurements are an important thing. From my experience back in operations research or mathematics, there's a phrase we use, which is something is necessary but not sufficient for a particular result. And that's the case with measurements. There are things you can very readily measure but not readily hear, and there are things you can readily hear but not readily measure based on the very different technology that our ear and our brain um, work on compared to the way the instrument on my instruments on my test branch bench work. So we analyze the problem of what needs to be done, often in non-classical ways. It's not how do I get 100 watts with 0.05% distortion. It's how do I pass this musical signal with gain from the source component, a fine turntable for example, through to the speakers while maintaining the things that make it recognizably music to our ears. Uh, when you think about the measurement standpoint, for example, those of you who are married, you would instantly recognize your wife's voice, whether she's talking to you over the dinner table, whether she calls you on the phone, whether she's yelling to you in a parking garage, or whether she's whispering to you on the side of the pillow at night. None of those four conditions have the same frequency response, the same phase response, the same reflectivity. They're all different, but your brain is wired to know that's what that is. And we do the same thing with music. We know the sound, the projection of a saxophone. We know the lonely, hollow feel of a low-pitched hum in a big space on a drum kit. There are just things that say, that's real and that moves me. And that's what we analyze our circuits and our designs to try to preserve. What do you want to pass through? What do you want to prevent from getting through the signal? And you can talk about it in terms of signals and noise and frequency response. That's not the main thing. The main thing is, does it make music? Music is a form of communicating emotion. And one of the most powerful, I think, forms of communication we have. And Isaac can actually hold court much more eloquently than I on this. But you touched on the phrase um, time and space, the, the traveling through it. These really are time machines. There are occasions during a setup when I'll put on, say, Belafonte at Carnegie Hall, 
an old, well-known audio file recording. And when the system is right, I'm there and I'm crying because I, in 2023, am sitting in front of a great performer at the top of his game in the best venue, playing with the audience and having fun. And that cannot fail to touch you when you get it right. What we do is not produce a piece of electronics with specifications. We are trying to produce for you the experience of music that will make your life more enjoyable, inspire you, comfort you, all those kinds of things. Toward that end, there are some things we do that are important to make sure we can deliver that to you. One is, in the development of our product, we don't have, for example, a single reference speaker. We have about a dozen that we use during the development of the product. Some electrostatic, some very fine dynamics, like this amazing speaker here. Horn speakers, big speakers, small speakers. They all give me, for example, in the development of the power amplifier, a different angle of view into what that product is doing like triangulating and navigation toward a true destination. There are interesting cases where we have, well, let me back up, the way you use that is as we make a change to the amplifier, if the sound of all the speakers becomes more nuanced, more lifelike, we're pretty confident we're heading in the direction of real fidelity. If many get better, but none get worse, again, pretty sure we're going in the right direction. But when this speaker sounds better and that speaker sounds worse with the amplifier, we don't know that we're going in the right direction, so we don't make that change. We don't adopt that technique. Um, so interesting things happen. For example, in developing an amplifier a few years back, we had it sounding perfect on a wide range of speakers. But there was an obscure Italian wooden horn speaker we had, and the amplifier was kind of bright and hissy on that speaker. It made the smallest, almost insignificant change in the amplifier that speaker snapped into perfect sound, and you couldn't hear that we made that change on the other nine or 10 speakers at all. So we would work hard to make sure that our equipment will play well with others, that when you put the VAC in your system, regardless of what already constitutes that system, the system will improve. If we can do that 90% of the time, I think we're doing good. <laughs> um, every single piece we manufacture, I for repair or update, I personally will hear and approve before it leaves the factory. And if it's not within a hair of what I originally designed, it goes out for investigation, further work. That kind of close, not just measured, but subjective um, evaluation of the product helps us detect when a vendor has made a change in the way they make a wire or a capacitor or a number of things. So without going into detail about mass decoupling and linear triodes and low feedback and short ground paths. The main thing is we are here to make music, we are here to move you, and every single thing in this audio system is important. It, if someone says, is the speaker more important or the amp more important? The answer is, what's more important, your heart or your lungs? It all matters and finding things that work well together and people that are bloody minded about reproducing music with the full life and character. Um, uh, it's a joy to work with these people and we're very privileged to be in part of this room. And I hope that we can welcome some of you to the BAC family one of these days too. <laughs> and with I that see. being said, I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you what makes this special. And I want to bring this full circle. I started this by sharing a story of what it was like to sit down with Sherry Cora and listen to one of the most important recordings of my life, which was MTV Unplugged, Alice in Chains, listening to Lane Staley's final performance. And so I want to conclude this by giving you an opportunity to listen to the same piece of music that Sherry and I sat down to listen to a few days ago that really started this whole conversation. Thank you so much for giving us a few minutes of your time to talk a little bit about who we are, the philosophies that drive us, why we are all friends, and why this is the group that we chose to put together so that we could show you what it meant to bring an affordable time machine home.